We now honor the class of 25 years, those ordained in the year 1992. As your name is read, I invite you to rise or otherwise make yourselves known. Bless you and thank you. This from James Baldwin. Love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is growing up. It bears repeating. Love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is growing up. I have the great honor and privilege of introducing to you someone who needs no introduction. <laughs> so I'm done. Thanks a lot. Meg Riley began her professional life as a religious educator. And she believes she never set down that mantle. She has always been devoted to empowering those around her and trying to bring out the best in them. She has a commitment to the flip side of being an educator, which is she's always learning. She's always pushing herself. Now we know that Meg held many positions at the UUA. She was always at that intersection of faith and justice. She worked first for the youth programming and then for the GBLT programs. And then she headed up the Washington office and then she served lastly as director of the Faith and Advocacy and Witness Program. And then of course she served in a variety of national boards. Currently she serves as senior minister of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Now her resume is truly impressive, but what I want you to get is a glimpse of the content of her character. Meg is again always learning She's challenging herself to always walk the talk. She is a phenomenal ally who inspires me daily. She listens and she challenges. And she can make just about anything grow in her garden, <laughs> which is a remarkable, abundant place of fruits and vegetables and flowers interspersed with every sign you would imagine a Unitarian Universalist would have in their front yard. <laughs> she is committing and committed. And on a personal note, in the most challenging time of my life, she sent me a note. It said, choose one, go out for coffee, hang out in your living room and scream. I'll hold your hand while you cry and weep. Or I'll go to Goodwill and buy China, cheap China, and we'll throw it against the wall of your garage. <laughs> you can imagine which one I chose. <laughs> she does everything with abundance. The kind of abundance you find in her garden. That full range of feeling, rage, humility, courage, humor, and love, and lastly, 
fiery resilience. You left your plane ticket up here. <laughs> Oh, it's good to see you all. It is indeed an honor to be here, an intimidating one, I will add, <laughs> especially in this moment when I think, how, what could I say that could help this moment? But then I look at these hundreds of years of ministry before me, and I know that even if people did one thing a year, there are hundreds of good acts right here, and that we are enough. We can do this. As I look back on 25 years of ministry, there's plenty of reason to despair, but I also see really good reason to hope. Our collective ministry is so much stronger now. Thanks to people who have been working hard in this room and in other rooms, we are at a potential point of genuine transformation that we have labored for since long before even the 50-year honorees have dreamed it. When I wrote to my colleagues from 1992 to ask them about justice in their ministries over these years, many of them wrote back to me about love and presence and witness. This makes sense. After all, as Cornell West said, justice is what love looks like in public. My colleague Charlie Ortman wrote, one cannot be an effective minister with a congregation or in any other setting that I can imagine unless they are willing to open their hearts and love those whom they are serving. Only if we love those whom we serve can our invitation to beloved community be authentic. So I thought I'd offer a few reflections about love today. Few things I've learned about how to grow more love, how to grow up into love. I'll share three experiences that have transformed my ministry. I'm sure you have your own, but I hope that these might provide concrete and helpful support in this week ahead that is likely to test all of our abilities to love one another. <laughs> I offer these with deep gratitude for the many people in this room and many other rooms and who have gone on to a room we cannot see, who have loved me into ministry. My first experience. Some of you may remember Lola Peters, an African-American woman who worked at the UUA in the 1990s. Lola was a close friend and colleague for me in the early days of my ministry. One day she called me from her hotel, she was on the road for the UUA, and she shared a racist experience that had happened to her at a church. After she described what had occurred, I promptly told her that she had misunderstood and that it wasn't really racism. <laughs> Lola interrupted me after one sentence. I didn't call you because I needed the perspective of a white person, she said. <laughs> I called you because I needed the support of a friend. Oh, that was so clear, that sentence, so simple. I had a choice. I could respond as a white person or I could respond as a friend. In my mind's eye, I saw a model railroad where you can set the switch so it goes on this track or that track. And I thought, she's saying, track A goes to whiteness around and around that familiar place where I feel competent and comfortable, and track B goes someplace I don't go as often. I could go there, flip the switch. And Lola was simply saying, if you want to be my friend, flip the switch. So that's a little mantra, a little saying I give you for the week. If you start to feel yourself being an apologist for privilege, just stop and say, flip the switch and go the other way. <laughs> now, I'm talking primarily to white people about racism with this example, but it can work in any case where we don't know, where people are speaking from experience we don't have. We can flip the switch and decide we want to be their friend. It's not like 
Then I flipped the switch in 1992, and it's been a clear track all the way. I mean, I thought about it just this week. Two leaders of blue called me on stuff that I said, and that's only because I interacted with them. <laughs> We who are white have been so systematically trained by white supremacy to be ignorant. Isn't it humbling? I mean, if we quit fighting the facts that we're ignorant, maybe we could get out of our own way a little more, get a little smarter, and maybe we could be better friends. When someone whose experience we have not been raised to consider does us the loving service of pointing out where we are unconscious, we can be grateful to them for their act of love. If they didn't care, they would not say anything. They would leave us to our own ignorance. They are telling us how to be a friend, and while hearing what they have to say is often painful, believing what they say is the doorway to more love. We begin to understand over time that the pain reflected back to us is, in fact, our pain that we are projecting out on other people unconsciously all the time, and it is making us conscious. Which brings me to my second experience, another time when someone told me how to love better. Drama. <laughs> This time it was my own child who has given me permission to tell this story. Jai, who is now 20, has been gender non-conforming the whole way through, a decision that has brought painful consequences, but also has been a testament to Jai's courage and authenticity. When Jai was about 14, we went to a party, and at that stage, as we were working through the pronouns, I was instructed not to correct if people used male pronouns. So when someone I didn't know started talking to me and said, "Oh, your son was telling me about his school," we talked about the school, and then somebody that I knew well came along, and the stranger said, "Oh, we were just talking about her son's school," and the other person, thinking to be helpful, said, "She doesn't have a son." <laughs> so in the car on the way home, I described what had happened, and I said, "Jai, that felt so uncomfortable for me." Jai looked at me for a long moment and then repeated. <laughs> You felt uncomfortable. <laughs> I wonder how long you felt uncomfortable. <laughs> A final experience to share. <laughs> Failure is not only possible, not only probable. But if we want to grow love, failure is 100% inevitable. One of my core beliefs is that mistakes from which we learn, from which we learn, should be celebrated. I live with a baby who's been learning to walk for the past month, and it cracks me up. He'll start toddling and take a few steps, and usually when we clap, he falls. And I think he's, he thinks we're clapping for his falls because he usually falls just as we clap for him. And maybe we really are clapping for his falls because each fall says, "And I'm going to try again. This baby's going to toddle around again." So I thought I'd close for those of you who are new. This is a testament that you can really—I won't say what I would say to you if I was talking—mess up badly <laughs> and go on. You can go on. So, in the spring of 1992, I carefully prepared a sermon for delivery in the congregation where I was interning. I was in a congregation that used the lectionary, and I don't remember what scripture I was assigned, but whatever it was compelled me to share my belief. That Jesus was God, not because of suffering, but because of courage and love with which He lived. Suffering, I said, was incidental to His holiness. It wasn't super eloquent. It was I was no Rebecca Parker, and her book hadn't been published yet, so I couldn't quote her. <laughs> but I thought it was okay. It was a fairly typical UU sermon about Jesus, really. But the congregation where I was interning, Church of the United Community in Roxbury, Massachusetts, was not a typical UU congregation. The prevailing theology of this congregation, which was triple yoked, UU United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, was Black Liberation theology. 
The congregation was overwhelmingly people of color, primarily very poor people, many of them homeless and jobless. The whole Boston detox came every week. Crack and AIDS and gun violence and brutality were the normal stories shared in coffee hour. These were people who knew a great deal about suffering, and the resurrection was not an abstract idea to them. It was their hope and their path for staying alive. Reverend Graylin Hagler, the minister there, manifested the resurrection regularly in his sermons. So on this Sunday morning when I, a young, white, middle-class woman, student, shared my thoughts about holiness and suffering, the church gathered as usual on the top floor of a three-story building, a wooden building in the heart of Roxbury, Massachusetts, with a painted mural of Marcus Garvey on the side. Three flights of wooden stairs led up to the sanctuary. Windows opened behind the pulpit to the street and sidewalk below. A volunteer played a keyboard softly underneath the whole service, so you felt accompanied through prayers and through sermons. There was always this sound. The services were long, often more than three hours, in part because the people from detox would go downstairs and smoke and take breaks and then come back refreshed, ready to go on. So I began to share my sermon, sharing these words I had carefully crafted. As I began to deepen into my theme that suffering was not central to Jesus' divinity, people began to head out the back door <laughs> and walk down the stairs. And the women had on high heels, so it wasn't quiet. <laughs> clop, 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 clop. You could hear every step. Clop, 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 clop. More and more people. Clop, 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 clop. <laughs> Soon their conversation and their cigarette smoke started to drift up <laughs> through the window behind me. And I kept reading from my script. <laughs> it may not be literally true that my partner Kendrick was the only person left by the time I finished, but that's how I remember it. I knew it was bad even before the keyboardist walked out. <laughs> Eventually, I ran out of words and I sat down. <laughs> Eventually, people came back up to the service. <laughs> Afterwards, people were kind to me. They had something like pity in their eyes, <laughs> but they were kind. No one said a word about the sermon. Eventually, I went home and climbed into bed and cried. The next time I saw Reverend Hagler, who had been away and obviously had not heard me practice that sermon, <laughs> he just looked at me and raised his eyebrow and said, you learn anything? <laughs> That's all we said. <laughs> oh, yes, I learned. What did I learn? I learned that speaking with authority when I was out of my depths culturally and theologically was a horrible abuse not only of my ministerial power, but of the presence of the sacred itself. I learned that sometimes I should just shut up, just shut my mouth, just stop talking, even in the middle of a sentence. Even if it's embarrassing, just stop. I also realized with a start that without any intention to be so, I had been racist and offensive my whole life, literally thousands of times, in ways I probably had no ability to even name or see. And that people of color, over and over, had given me another chance, had seen my humanity anyway, had kept teaching me. I learned that mistakes, even huge public mistakes, could be opportunities to learn and move on and try to do better. 
And I learned, and my prayer is that we as a people can do this in these days ahead to look up from my paper and pay attention to the people in the room, most particularly the people in the room expressing pain about oppression. That is my prayer for our General Assembly. I've seen us do otherwise too many times. May these words born of my blundering help you to make new mistakes as we grow into more love. Flip the switch. Ask yourself, how long have I been uncomfortable? <laughs> Put down the paper and look around. Thank you. <laughs>